We're here at the base of the mountain in the Jabal Laws Range with two major peaks right beside it. But here we have everything that is stated in scripture is at the altar that Moses and the Israelites built. The columns that were dedicated to the 12 tribes of Israel and the holding pins where they took the animals to be slaughtered. All this we find at the base of this mountain in Midian, where scripture says Mount Sinai is located. This is the third day of our expedition at Mount Sinai. Yesterday, my beloved Catherine and I decided to marry at Moses' altar. We spent half the night getting ready. Be ready the third day. Yehovah will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Yehovah called Moses and all the elders up to the mountain, right up there, and speaks to Moses and relays his covenant and his rulings Moses then comes down and repeats them to all the people. All the people answered with one voice, we will obey every word. We will obey every, every word. word. Catherine, Miles spoke words of his, his love and his covenant promise to you. Will you accept those? I do. Miles, Catherine has spoken her words and covenant promises to you. Do you accept them? I do. So, from this point forward, you're known as Mr. and Mrs. Jones. And it came to pass on the third day, there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and the voice of the shofar exceedingly loud. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. This is my last interview of the day. It's been a long one, but a great one here at NRB 2024, right here in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm here with Dr. Miles Jones, who is the founder and director of the Benet Imuna Institute. Did I say that correct? Very good. The House of Faith. That you I did great. It. I practiced it like three times before we went on the air here. But he's an author. He's an archaeologist. You know, the second one that I've had on today. And we're going to go way back in time. I did not know this until off camera. Uh, Dr. Miles told me, he said, you know, Jimmy, there's a big um, discrepancy within the church. Church tra tradition holds that Mount Sinai is in the Sinai Peninsula. That's what I've always been told. I didn't uh, ever... Egypt. Egypt. Right. I, I didn't have a reason to doubt that, but I didn't know that much about it. He says that, no, it's actually in Saudi Arabia. And he's going to provide evidence for that today, as, as well as why that should matter. Why should we know about that? Why should we care? Um, because I think it does matter, right? Oh, yes, it does. Ah. So tell us, how did you get your start in this world? 
of archaeology and going back and looking at manuscripts. Kind of through the back door. I have, <laughs> <laughs> I have three degrees in languages and linguistics. So I was called by, I was called by Yehovah to go find the evidence of the Exodus, you know, and I was actually studying the origin of the alphabet. You know, there's only been one alphabet. Did you know that? The, all, the, all, the, all the hundreds of alphabets that are in the world today, they can all be traced back to one single original alphabet. You can, you can trace them right back. It's not, this is not controversial at all. But that one original alphabet appeared at the time of the Exodus in the path of the Exodus. Okay. All right. When I, when I read this shortly after I was converted in, in 2000, I, I, I prayed about it and I said, well, um, could that be the original alphabet? And very simply, Yahweh said to me, yes. And you are going to go find the evidence of it and yeah. carry that message. Because right now I have doubts, as I should, because you're telling me this. Yeah. But yeah. that's going to make me dig. Yes. So right. what about like, so you, So how old would this how, this original alphabet that you're talking about was the original seed that all the, the branches and the tree grew from? How old are we talking well, the Mount Sinai part of it happened in 1500, but it, its origins were in in Egypt. So they took some of the hieroglyphs and used them to create their own alphabet they, they started to use. Now, it was pictographic at first, and we know that precursor alphabet very well. And just to jump to the end of the story, we, it's now been found through my research and the research of others, it's been found in Egypt, at Wadi El Hol, at Luxor, in the Sinai Peninsula, at Serbet Hadim, the ancient Egyptian mines, at Mount Sinai in Arabia. And now, lately, the latest discovery is at Joshua's altar in the Promised Land. The same alphabet, the precursor to the alphabet of letters that we have today. What would you call this alphabet? What's the official name? It's called Paleo-Hebrew. Paleo Hebrew. So it would be, it would be a Hebrew language, the first one. It is Hebrew. And it is also, you, you, know, you mentioned the word hieroglyphs. Yes, they were, they, they were imitating the hieroglyphs, a simplified glyph, some of them, not all of them, but a simplified glyph that was like a little pictograph, a little picture. All right. Okay. But, but you're then, not calling that a language. So no, I'm calling it, yes, alphabet. it is an alphabet. It was a pictographic alphabet. But then at Sinai, especially, he said, no, don't do that. Don't make any graven images. What were graven images? Well, they were glyphs that came out of Egypt. That's all they knew, right? Those were graven images. Okay. He said, don't use pictures. People will, because people will bow down to them and worship them. So he had those, those became a symbolic alphabet of letters. They're a lot easier to write. It was just a development, steady development of the alphabet. So it came out of Mount Sinai, and there's the alphabet symbols that we know today. The A is still recognizable. Okay. For example. So they, they move those. When people think Mount Sinai, they're going to think Moses. They're going to think going up and getting right the tablets and, and the Ten Commandments. Is that the language that was written on the Ten Commandments? Yeah. No, we're talking about an alphabet. Now, an alphabet can be used for more than one language. Okay. All right. In this case, they took signs from the Egyptians and used it for their Hebrew out. Their Hebrew language. Right. So, so it like was, in French, we're going to use the same letters as English. But, but yes, we will. But we're a different language. Sure. But we know they're written in Hebrew because they left inscriptions at Mount Sinai in Arabia. That's how I originally got involved. I translated those inscriptions. And they are written in Hebrew. Or you might want to call it proto-Hebrew. Go as far back as you know about Hebrew. Okay, what came before that? So they have this... Proto-Hebrew, this proto-alphabet, came before the original one that became the symbols that we know today, which came from the Hebrew alphabet. Okay. The Greeks borrowed them. So, so the and they spread all over the world. So what you're saying, though, that, that this logically follows, that everybody from Lamech and Methuselah and Jared and Enoch and all these people pre-Moses had no written language. They did. They did. Yes, but it was, it was pictographic writing. And like the, the, the said, you've seen the Egyptian graded. glyphs, right? Yeah, yeah. It'd be hard to write in that, wouldn't it? Very. Yeah. Okay. When there's also cuneiform, Babylonian cuneiform, which originally was pictographic, it was too hard to write little images like that. It's very, very hard to write them. So it became abstracted, but it was still not an alphabet as we know it. An alphabet is one symbol 
one sound. Okay, very easy to write, very easy to learn. And that was the alphabet. In fact, that is the alphabetic principle, which comes down to us from Mount Sinai. Because it says in scripture, you know, the, by the message, the, uh, the message of what has been written and the character of the message, right? Right. The meaning and the character. And so you get the, you get the sense of the scripture, but you also were literally given the alphabet, the medium of the message right. at Mount Sinai. You got me curious. It's, here. it's called the writing of God in scripture, 32, 16. Interesting. It okay. says the word of God. He gave us the word of God and the writing of God from Mount Sinai. And this is what started my, my whole quest is that what is this writing of God? Right? Is this the original alphabet that we know came in? And like I said, that's not controversial. Everybody knows that. Okay. But we don't know. There's a lot of controversy about where and when it started. Okay. What we've discovered is it definitely started at Mount Sinai, right? In Midian. We have the inscriptions from the ancient Hebrews there, the ancient Israelites, and a wealth of other evidence that they were there. Okay. Cultural icons, before, imagery. Before we jump into Mount Sinai, what it, where it really is, because I want to get into that and why yeah. that matters. Uh, I do have one. When you said about the graven images, you know, I was always taught, and I still kind of you know, think, okay, graven image that's talking about, you know, crafting an idol or yes. making it, which I know that God would have said, don't do that either, right? Yes. I don't fair. think about Egyptian hieroglyphs, like it doesn't logically follow. Well, they're going to worship these pictures. Just like today, like if I look at a great, beautiful painting, I don't fall down and worship it. I appreciate it. Well, they did in Egyptian times. You know, they, they worshiped them. And they were. They were the, the standing idols and graven images were two different things, but they were both abominations of the same time, the same, of the same kind. Do not make any graven images nor standing idols. Do not bow down to them or, or worship them. And the Egyptians did that. They'd have a statue. They'd have writing on all sides of it. You bow down to these things and worship them. But you don't think it's a problem today if an artist is painting good imagery? I do not think it's a, a, a problem, as long as you're not worshiping it. Yeah. And but th this can be a tricky problem because, you know, a lot of people worship the piece of wood that is the cross. Yeah. Right? A lot of people, they, they don't get it. Worshiping at the cross is one thing. We're worshiping the sacrifice of our Savior which is incredibly profoundly meaningful. We're not worshiping a piece of wood. But I think some people cross the line and they start worshiping things right. rather than Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach himself or Yehovah or God, right? Who is, who is a God who refuses to be pictured. That makes sense. So yeah. you won't, so you won't worship pictures. You can lose your way real easy. I guess, I guess the reason the question comes up in my mind is because I'm so far removed from Egyptian culture. Yeah. And the last thing in my, I mean, even if, if yeah. an artwork is beautiful, it's, it's going to, I'm going to be hard pressed to start worshiping the thing. So yeah. I'm, I'm looking at it from that modern day Christian lens. Let's move forward to today. So there's a discrepancy between what Bible colleges and secular colleges are teaching about the location of Mount Sinai right. versus where it's really at. Start with why this matters. Well, this was the, 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 the events at Sinai, the Sinai Covenant, and the events of the Exodus, they are the supremely major intervention of Yehovah on behalf of his chosen people. It's the biggest event in the Old Testament. The entire foundation of belief in God, you know, and the Exodus itself, yes. and the Sinai Covenant from which comes the law, which all of our ideas of legality, human rights, moral beliefs, it's all based on that. Our Judeo-Christian values are all based on that, Mount Sinai. It's extremely important. So if this didn't happen, if this is a, if this is a myth, which is what secularists claim, then with the Bible is nothing so, of authority. We don't have to. We don't have to. We yes. don't have to obey the moral precepts. So, from a secular from pagan or atheistic pr perspective, that you're going to get at a lot of major universities, I get that the authority the of the, the Bible is based on Sinai. A lot of churches are going going left. Right, right. But they, you said they we're at a tipping point where there's enough evidence now yeah. that people are in the church world to be to say, "Well, well, yes, you know, maybe Dr. Miles has on to something here." Well, it's not just me. There's a lot of people that know this now, but we have been working on it for 15 years, trying to bring this to people's attention, and it, it has been working. The tipping point has been reached. 
Uh, most people are aware there's a debate over the location of Mount Sinai. They know that it actually is in Midian, in Arabia, or at least they know that's one side of the story. That's where it says it is in Scripture. It's in Midian, in Arabia. Well, then why would Bible colleges and my Sunday school teacher and you know the church world for so many years be saying that it's not? Because it's church tradition that says it's in Egypt ever since Constantine in the fourth century. So it was Constantine that sort of started, or his people? Yes, that, and you're, you're not going to go against him, are you? Was that a You get your head like, cut, yeah. lopped off, and so it became a part. And they had actually lost track of where the mountain was. Yeah. It, it says that in Kings. You are the ones who have forgotten my holy mountain. It says that in First Kings. So they would kind of lost track of it, right? So, and they, were, they weren't there, so they did, they, it just that kind of got stuck in the historical vein, right? But it's not there, it's actually where it says it is in the Bible, it's in Midian, in Arabia. Now you go to Midian, Arabia, and you find an overwhelming amount of evidence of the Exodus and the Sinai Covenant. You find the writing of God that's there, which was written in the original alphabet that was given to the Hebrews on tablets of stone straight from Yehovah on the mountain. It was, what was it written in? I mean, I'm a linguist. So when I started rereading the Bible after I was saved, I got to this Exodus 32, 16, that, that the tablets were the word of God and the writing was the writing of God on the tablets. And I started, well, what, what is this writing of God? Could this be the original alphabet that was found in the path of the Exodus at the time of the Exodus? Yes. And God said to me, yes, you're right. And you're going to find the evidence of that and carry that message. Interesting. And it, it really, it was it was delivered to me. I said, how can I possibly do that? I was whining. <laughs> I was whining to God. I admit it. I admit it. I've gotten better since then. But I said, how can I possibly do that? How could anything possibly have survived for that long? And how much money would it take to mount an expedition to go to Arabia and find it? By the way, I recently did mount that expedition in March of 2023. It hasn't even been a year yet. And we went and documented that evidence there. But back in the beginning, I said, well, I don't know how would this, this is going to happen, but if you open the doors I cannot open, I'll charge through them. And so within a few weeks, I encountered the people who had gotten the evidence of the evidence at Mount Sinai out of the country, Jim and Penny Caldwell. And I called them up and told them what I was looking into, the writing of God. And they said, how interesting you should call. We have inscriptions from the base of Mount Sinai. You think you could translate them for us? And these, and they sent them to me. So inscriptions from the base. So they had to dig down to get to these inscriptions. They didn't have to dig. They, they were, they were on the surface. But this, how would this not have been wind, wind, you know, blown and what, what's it called when stuff deteriorates over time? Well, yeah, corruption, but rocks don't really corrupt very easily. Well, they're right? thousands of years. Right, but if they're protected in an area, you know, they don't necessarily have, in this part of Arabia, there are not shifting sand dunes. There are a lot of mountains of rock. There's plenty of sand, but they're not these huge dunes that shift around and cover things up. This is an area that has been untouched literally for 3,500 years. Totally in touch. Okay. And therefore, it has remained protected. Okay. It's right. a, but it's a very legitimate question. Yeah, you just think of weathering. and, and Yes. You know. And when you have civilizations, they build on top of their own garbage yeah. and their own ruins from previous cities. So they really, you're looking for mounds to evacuate, right? Right. But in an area that did not have any population and has not been for, for 3,500 years, there's really nothing... They have been perfectly preserved because of that. They're etched in rock. That doesn't go away. Is the is the importance of this ultimately for inquiring minds that need evidence more so than than like from a spiritual perspective? Okay, I can as a boy, I can accept Christ. I can live for Him, or as a man, whatever, and not know where Mount Sinai is. Sure, but believe it existed. Believe the stories of the Old Testament and the New, and go to heaven. Yes, right. You so, absolutely again. So, but there's other people that really need proofs, and I'm yes. one of those. Yeah. Well, there's there's two things. Number one is, even if you're a total faithful believer, your faith can still be strengthened by the knowledge that we have evidence of the Exodus and the Sinai Covenant and the writing of God that came from the Sinai Covenant. I know my faith has been enormously strengthened by the things we've discovered at Mount Sinai. 
right? So that's one. But for the unbeliever that maybe have a spiritual bent and, you know, want to believe, but just can't buy all of this stuff in the Old Testament, right? Yeah, right. To prove that the, the timeline of the Bible is correct, the correct one, that the location of the events is known and there's evidence of these events, you know, that they actually happened, that they actually existed, right? This can really open a door for them. Yeah. Right now, the that spirit. The, they still have to ask the spirit to come into them, but now we just opened the gate that they can go through yeah. and do that. They're much more likely yeah. to do that. So, for secularists, if you will, that have never had any experience with the Bible, proving the truth of those events can be a huge, huge yeah. invitation to them to take that next step and ask for the spirit of God. To come into that. That's good. The spirit of Yeshua. That makes sense to me. So if somebody wants mm-hmm. to look, go deep with this and learn more about it now, so you know, I put all the links to my guests in the description. So uh-huh. the description of this video tonight will have all of your links. Or we, like I'm looking at this, the the evidence from the real Mount Sinai, a personal study journal yes. with video teachings. Right. Well, this is this is part of the Writing of God TV course work. Now there's also a book, The Writing of God, that has all of the research evidence in it. This is a Pirtle's personal study journal that goes with it. Okay. And there are also, of course, the video lessons themselves. So it's a whole course. It can even be taken for credit if you want it. Uh, okay. So wow. that that's very cool. Because this is so important for another for reason. College credit? Like- college credit, yes. Oh, okay. You can get it, get credit for it. So uh but there's another reason that is really, really important to us is that. The exodus is the tip of the spear in separating our children from their faith in the universities. And the, the, and they, they feel like the exodus from the Bible is the key moment in time where they try to direct people away from. Right. By saying it's false. It's obviously false. You know, it didn't happen in, in the time the Bible says it is, did, did. Right. It happened. We, we know it happened two centuries later. You have to look there. Okay, well, you look two centuries later. It happened in the 15th century BC. That's the biblical time of it. If you look two centuries later in the 13th century BC, Jericho is not even inhabited. Okay. Right? And they say, well, absolute, no evidence of the Exodus at all in the 13th century. You have to look there. Well, why, why do you have to look there? You know, Jericho was destroyed two centuries before. Why would there be a Jericho right. after that? It was totally razed to the ground. You know, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they're, you know, they're, it's a bait and switch. It's right? a, well, it seems like a purposeful misdirection. Yes. Like it, they know it it's is. not there. I'm not saying every professor knows, but they're going off what they've been told. And no, and I'm not trying to smear every professor either. Some have been taught this all their life. Right. So they, that's all they know. You know, others may know better, but you know, they're not going to destroy their they're academic. Keeper, keepers of the secular kingdom, man. They're not going to give N- that up. N- exactly. <laughs> no, they're, you know, they, they don't want to believe. They don't want to credit the Israelites with anything, you know, and they certainly don't want to be the one who proves the Bible is is authentic right. and, and and the truth. You know, they want the Bible to be untrue so they can basically separate you from your faith. Because if it didn't happen, if it happened two centuries later and in a different place, well, like in Egypt rather than in Arabia, well, then the Bible is an inaccurate history, right? So what does that say about the message of the Bible? That can't be accurate either, can it? Right. right? No, so they can get you to go down this yeah. rabbit trail for which there is no evidence. Then they can well, separate you from your faith. Yeah. One little crack can destroy the whole pot, right? Yeah. Right. So that, that's, that's the main tool that they use, really, because that's the supreme event in the Old Testament in which Yehovah intervened on behalf of his chosen people. So it's very, very important. Everyone should do this so they can actually speak, you know, intelligently and with the facts about the truth about the Exodus. And we have it now, you know, and it was no easy thing. You know, they've got a whole orthodox chronology of the ancient world that is wrong. We, right. And we, what we did is we used scientific retro calculation of celestial events that are mentioned in the Bible or in the ancient records. You can go back, you, you, you know, we can predict, we can predict a, an eclipse. One is happening in my hometown in Kerrville, Texas in April 8th. How do we do that? 
we know the mathematics of the spheres and their orbits. Right. But we can also not only predict them for the future, we can retrocalculate them in the past if we know enough about where they happened, right? Sure. We can just look it up. There's only one. For example, there was uh, uh, an eclipse called the Bursagal comet. It's named at the Bursagal eclipse, named after the official who recorded it. Okay. Bursagal, right. okay, because the ancients did this. They watched the skies. It's in the first uh, chapter of Genesis. I will put lights in the firmament, and they will be for signs and for appointed times. The, the word is moedim. It's usually translated as seasons. It can mean the seasons and the festivals of the seasons, but mainly it means appointed times. And this is different than astrology. No, it's not astrology. This is astronomy. Yes. Now, the astrology, uh, you know, that there are different uh, star patterns in the skies, and they rotate through the skies every night. And they're different. If you go down to Australia, it's going to be different. You're going to see different Sure. You know, and these are the signs of the zodiac. They're called. And I'm just saying, you're making a difference here between oh, there those is two big things. Difference. The mathematics of signs. Yeah, these are these are signs in the heavens that God created. So there's they're real, right? Now astrologers have gone and turned this into a a soothsaying profession. Right. So don't go to astrologers. No, that's not that's not a correct. There's not a chapter in your book about astrology. No, there is. There, no, that's not godly. You know, but the signs themselves are heavenly signs and. A lot of times there will be there will be verses in the Bible that you just can't understand, and they're actually talking about the pattern of stars in the sky. Virgo, right? The Virgin, right? You know, in Revelation, the woman who goes into the wilderness to give birth to the to the to the Christ yes. child. That's the body of Christ. That, you know that 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 is talking about stars in the zodiac in the heavens huh. because they can tell you what time of the year this stuff happened and things like that. Right. So they're they are used. But not like astrology. Astrology right. is a perversion uh, of God's signs in the heavens, right? Yeah. So then now uh, we're more familiar with eclipses. Like I said, there's going to be one in my hometown in Kerrville, Texas, April 8th. Actually crosses my property where our institute that you can now pronounce the Benayim and I Institute. <laughs> I got to look at the word. It crosses right over our property. Yep. B'nai Yemunah. B'nai Yemunah, the household of faith. Got it. Right. Got it. So, so we've got this here. Now, we just had an eclipse. An eclipse happens in any particular place about one every 360 years. We just had one five months ago. All right. So this is a second eclipse at the exact same spot. Now, in our, really rare. Up, on, up on a hillside outside of Kerrville, it's become a big tourist attraction worldwide. We have a 77-foot hollow cross. All right. It's huge. All right, and a, and a garden of sculpture of Yeshua, you know, and, and in the various parts of his ministry. And now that, that cross is getting a cross from God. You've had two passive, two eclipses within six months of each other that cross at that same place. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. I mean, it's God's cross. Don't start worshiping that cross, though. Now. We've been I don't. About I'm very well aware of that. <laughs> I've written articles about that. You're going kind of deep here. <laughs> I said, you've got to remember, pray. you can pray at the cross, don't pray to, to the, cross. the cross. Yeah, cross. That's is, a good word. The that's cross good word is not an object of, you know, it's, it reminds us of the sacrifice of our, of our Savior, which is a good thing, but it is not a magical thing. I mean, powerful item in itself. Don't 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 make it into one. Well, where would you? There's a lot of books we could talk for a long time about any of this stuff. Yeah. Where, where would you like someone to start if they want to if they want to get into this? Well, we, on, on what's your we doing? actually I wrote a book that's coming out because in doing the research on the Exodus, I spoke about the celestial events in the heavens and what they mean. Right. So I, I learned how to retro calculate these events so that we could anchor the things that happened in the Bible. Okay. For example, we talked about the Bursagal, the Bursagal eclipse in Nineveh. Well, that happened in the time at that particular time, 763 BC. When you retrocalculate an eclipse, you have an exact date down to the day, the year, the day, the hour, the second, right? Jeroboam was on the throne of Israel, right? And there was a prophet in his time named Jonah. You probably remember that yeah, guy, yeah, right? Yeah. And you have a sin. And I remember him. Jeroboam because my wife named a fish after Jeroboam in our house. <laughs> Weird. Well, <laughs> Jonah was sent to Nineveh, right? Because it was a great city, but it had fallen into corruption. It was so corrupt that he was going to destroy it. But he always warns us, 
He always warns us. So he sent Jonah to Nineveh. Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh, yeah. right? Because they were not his people. Understandable. And being a prophet is a very dangerous profession. Yeah, everybody gives Jonah a bad rap these days. I'm like, I kind of get it. He didn't want to get They're going to kill him probably. Like, Yeah, yeah I'm sure he... I, I kind of understand. I think he thought I that, absolutely. For Jonah. But he, but he gets he gets swallowed by the big fish, right? Now, who are they worshiping in Nineveh? They're worshiping Dagon, yeah. which is a fish god, right? So now Jonah comes out of the mouth of this huge fish, and they listen to him, all right? And he says, you have to repent. Our God will destroy you. He always warns us. He always warns us. We don't always listen, but he always warns us, right? But in this case, they had plagues. They had riots. They had a total eclipse, right? And yeah. the king and all his people repented. They turned and they repented, right? And God stayed his hand over over Nineveh and did not destroy them. That's a very hopeful lesson to yeah. me. We can repent and be saved. And usually when there's a, a huge event like this, and remember, we're having two eclipses at the same time. Well, one has happened already. And there's another in one. In your hometown. Yeah, right in my hometown. It goes through my hometown. Right. Those other places, too. Did you know that there's a, uh, a Nineveh in Texas? Well, now Rough you know. God. Now <laughs> you know. This eclipse will be visible from Nineveh, Texas. This same eclipse will be visible from Nineveh, Oklahoma. Oh. It'll be visible from Nineveh, Ohio. From Nineveh, Missouri. From Nineveh, Pennsylvania. From Nineveh, New York. Well, you know from, your Ninevehs. And from Nineveh, Nova Scotia. He practiced, he practiced that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it goes through. Eight Ninevehs can be visible. Does that tell you anything? Do you think these are coincidences? I, I guess not. Uh, that, that's uh, amazing. Well, I pray about them. And if he tells me, if he tells me it's a coincidence, uh, I, if it's a coincidence, I'll believe him. But in this case, I get the very strong sense he's warning us. I mean, really, do any of your viewers have any doubt that things are going to hell around here in this country and all over the world? There's not many. There's so much, con there's so much evil and there's so much corruption. All of our institutions are falling apart from the corruption and the, the evil people that are in placed in, in positions of authority. You know, John Adams said it very well, you know. Uh, you know, one of the creators of the Constitution, he says, democracy only works for a, a religious people or a moral people. It's totally unsuited for any other population. Yeah. Right? Because you know, you have to preserve these and you have to have people of of honor, you know, in the FBI. Yeah, you know, and in, in in the court system. And yeah, if, if you too. don't have them, right. If you don't have them, you're gonna see what we're seeing now. So is it that hard to believe that he's warning us? No, not at all. It's not hard I, I to believe. I think we've had many warnings along the way. Uh, yeah, I do too. So, but you know, you know, he gives you a, always gives you a final warning. You know? Yeah. So let's listen. Let's heed it. <laughs> let's, let's listen. Eat. Let's repent. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Miles, I'm going to put all your links in the description. Thank you. This was a fascinating conversation, mm -hmm. and I think very more important than I knew. Yeah. And I think many of the audience will feel the same way. So yeah. Thank well, you for your work. Well, thank you. It's great the work you're doing, getting the word out. There's few enough that are telling the truth. So yes. thanks to you and to your listeners. You heard it here. All right, guys, we're going to close out day one at NRB right here with Dr. Miles Jones. Today on In Grace, we're in Saudi Arabia climbing the real Mount Sinai. The story of Exodus is huge. Millions of people freed by mega miracles. And then the granddaddy of all miracles, the Red Sea parts, and Israel is saved, born as a nation. Then God leads them to a series of encampments, bringing them closer and closer to the promised land. Before the promised land, God wants to bring them to a special place his mountain in the desert. There, they'll receive the law and set up the tabernacle. Today, we're going to search for and hopefully ascend what is possibly the real Mount Sinai. Before that, we're gonna explore a massive split rock 
the possible location of another great miracle. We will start today in the town where Jethro lived and find more evidence that this land in modern Saudi Arabia is in fact ancient Midian. Now we're at Jethro's tomb. Yes. Is that, or tombs? tombs? Tombs of Jethro? Yeah. So this is Islamic tradition again in this area. They call it the tombs of Jethro. So Jethro and his family. It's interesting though, is that you have Josephus, the Jewish historian, mm -hmm. talking about the Midianites living in caves. Oh. And so this hillside, which overlooks the oasis, is dotted with caves. It's possible that the Midianites lived in these caves if Josephus had correct information. And later the Nabataeans came along and created their tombs. Amazing. Uh, after all these years, this has survived. It is amazing. All right, so we're actually in one of these tombs, a little eerie, a little spooky. Uh, hopefully they've excavated this properly and there's no one still in here. Yeah, I don't think there is. I mean, you can see uh, looking around the sarcophagus mm -hmm. niches, mm -hmm. and it's like a two-room tomb with a small room in the back for maybe the patriarch. And then as you stand here looking out, you can see the oasis. That's an amazing view. You see the green oasis against the harsh desert in the background. You see Mount yeah. Sinai and the uh, Jebel Allah's range. Yeah, so from the tomb called the Tombs of Jethro, you see the oasis, which is it's called Midian, the town of Midian, the area of Midian, and the well of Moses, still called the well of Moses, on their signage today. It's just so many connection points. It's amazing. Amazing. You can imagine the Midianites living here, and every night when the Israelites were encamped at Mount Sinai, the fire of God's on that mountain. So you, oh, from this side of the mountain sure. range, you could see Mount Sinai on fire. No kidding. That must have been spectacular. Or frightening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I was going to call it frightening, because that was like thunderings, shakings, lightnings, you know. It was, and, and certainly they would have still been experiencing that noise from way over here. Earlier, Moses had experienced God here in Midian at a bush that was burning, but was not consumed. So a big story in Moses' life before the Exodus was a burning bush. Yeah. So what would that have been like? As he was walking, and he'd probably seen a lot of these, you know... There's a lot of brush bushes. out here. Yeah. yeah. So in the story, he's with Jethro's sheep. So we're on the west side of the mountain range near the traditional home of Jethro. How far from, from where we're standing to where Jethro lived? Um, less than 20 miles. Yeah. So we're, we're very close, like a day's journey. Mm -hmm. Certainly would have been where a grazing area. Well, in fact, we've met shepherds out here with their mm -hmm. goats and sheep. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and so he, was, he saw the burning bush. And it says that was his first encounter with God on the mountain. It called it the mountain of God. Okay. That's how he identified Mount Sinai. Huh. He saw the burning bush on it. And so that's the first reference we've had to... Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, the mountain of God yes. there in Exodus. And he sees a bush on fire, not consumed. He takes off his shoes because he's on holy ground. Mm -hmm. And he has this conversation. He learns, God says, I am that I am. A statement of uh, pre-existence and eternity. There's so much to unpack there. But what I think we should do here at this burning bush is see if we can recreate the miracle. <laughs> we'll so, try. Okay. Yeah, let's try it. So you have a lighter. Let's yeah. see if we can uh, set this thing on fire. Now, if it burns and is not consumed. But take your shoes off. Yeah, I will be taking my shoes off. So let's see what let's we can see. do here. Okay. No, we, we have some kindling here, but uh, it's kind of windy today. Let's see. I see you were a Boy Scout. <laughs> <laughs> Trained in the wilderness of Midian. <laughs> Uh, we got smoke. We have some fire. It's uh, catching the kindling on fire. Okay, folks, we have a burning bush here in the desert. It's being consumed, so it's not a miracle, but check this out. Now, hopefully, we won't burn down the whole desert. On this holy ground, God told Moses that he would free his people. Now, Moses is leading the people back to his holy ground to meet the Lord himself. But here at Rephidim, the last campsite before Mount Sinai, the people again begin to complain. 
Andrew, this is a really awesome sight. You can see behind us this massive yeah. rock and it's split. And Psalms does talk about the rock that Moses struck was claved or split and water coming out of the rock. So give us all the details about this. Well, so this is the area what would be Rephidim. And that was the last camping site before the Israelites camped in front of Mount Sinai. And so if you look at the geography of Midian, this is on the western side of the Mount Sinai range, the Jebel Allah's range, which is behind us. And on the eastern side is the big campground with the big plain, the cave of Elijah, the mountain that had the fire on it. And so we're just north of that, but we're still part of these mountain peaks. And so it was in this area that they complained of lack of water. And it, as you can see, it's very dry. There's no oasis here. And they come here and they tell Moses, like, why have you brought us out into the wilderness to die again? And so they keep complaining about that. And when they get here, God tells Moses, stand by the rock of Horeb. He said to strike the rock. And so when you think about it, there are rocks all Everywhere. over here. Yeah, there's yeah. rocks. And there's a lot of them that are kind of just somewhat prominent yeah, small. and, you know, big. But Yeah, there's big ones too. But he says the rock. And so yeah. everyone would have known because of the way this one just sticks it's up. It's on a hill. Yeah. It sticks out from a far away distance. You yeah. can see this clave rock stick, like, almost like a hand sticking up there. And there's a whole area around here with a flat plain. Mm -hmm. And so you have plenty of space for Israelites to encamp. You have plenty of space outside the encampment for the battle with the Amalekites. Yeah. So perfect picture, of course, of Jesus because he's the rock mm -hmm. and he was struck and he brings life, water, living water to anyone who will take it freely. Now, you mentioned the Amalekites. So that was another episode that happened here as well. Yeah. And it was maybe because of the water that they came against that's, Israel. That's possible because that happened after the split rock, you know, Moses struck and the water came out, you know, the rivers of water. Mm -hmm. So they're probably wondering, like, where's this water coming from into the desert? They follow it into the Israelite encampment and they were marauders, they were bandits, and they started attacking the Israelites in the, the rear, it says, and the, oh. you know, those who are the slower ones in the back. And that's where we hear the story of Moses standing with his arms, arms yeah. yeah, raised. And whenever his arms were raised, Israel was winning. Yeah. And, but he was getting tired and you know, you can only hold up your arms so long. I used to coach basketball team and I'd make them run around with the arms up and it doesn't oh, sound wow. like that's hard, but it is. <laughs> so then he had Aaron and her come alongside and hold his, arm, his uh, arms up. Yeah. Beautiful pictures of, you know, how we can support people of faith, people of God. You know, God works in interesting ways. You know, why were they winning when his arms were raised? You know, it's just, mm -hmm. it's curious, but all happened right here. Yeah. It's amazing to be at these spots. And again, you have this massive rock that's split. You have a mountain that, you know, they could have encamped to the east. All of it fits scripture here in Midian mm -hmm. and here in Saudi Arabia. After they left here, they went to the, the front side of yeah, this mountain? Yeah, front side, okay. east side. So what would that route have been? So there is a big wadi, which we were actually driving through. Uh -huh. A wadi is a dry riverbed, a, a valley, and it just goes all the way around the mountain range to the east side. How long would that take to walk From, around? It's tough to know. There are some little shortcuts. Definitely, you know, in the biblical account, they had about 30 days from the wilderness of Sin, which was a 30-day mark after they left Egypt. So they either had 15 more days or another 30 days to get to the front side, and that includes camping at Rephidim. So it does fit the path that they could have walked. It does fit the chronology. Well, I'd say let's go there next. Let's go to the front side of Mount Sinai and maybe climb it. I don't know. Do you think I can climb the mountain? Yeah, um, it's a tough climb, but let's go do it. Now, I didn't ask you if we should do it. I said, do you think I should do it? <laughs> <laughs> I think you could do it. You think so? Yeah. Okay. And so with Andrew's resounding vote of confidence, we headed to our final destination in this epic adventure. Driving to what is possibly the holy mountain of God, I was reminded of Exodus 19:18, And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. The whole mount quaked greatly. With great reverence, we approached this awesome place. All right, Andrew, we're at the base of Mount Sinai. Yes. And there are some interesting things here at the base that, again, tie into the story of Exodus. 
You have the golden calf, calf altar, altar not far from here, just yeah. over this hill. Now, and there's other stuff, right? Yeah, if you look at the very top of this peak in front of us here, there is actually a cave. The only cave on the mountain. Uh -huh. And we know from 1 Kings chapter 19 that Elijah fled here and said he dwelt in a cave one night in Horeb. And so there is a cave up there. Okay. Um, and then you do, again, have the stream bed that comes out of the mountain. Deuteronomy talks about a stream that flowed down from the mountain. It said Moses ground the golden calf and sprinkled the powder into the stream and made the Israelites drink it. So had it been enough water for one to two million people to drink. And they were in this area for 11 months. Yeah. So they had to have a water source. And if they weren't complaining, yeah. they must have had water. water. And he mentioned the stream. So wow. there's, there's definitely Everything, natural. Everything's right here yeah. at the base. And then I want to get up on this mountain and, you know, see you know, what else is up there and see if it all fits the criteria because it looked like there was like a plateau or a bench area where the 70 elders and some others would have been as Moses went higher. So from my understanding, this mountain has it all. It does. And so I don't know why someone would just reject it outright. I think they need to look at the evidence more for those who are interested, you know, come out here to Saudi Arabia and check it out. And it's cool that it has the look of a burnt top. Yeah, and that's where the name comes from. Yeah. Double Makla, Mountain of Burnt or wow. Burning. Before climbing Jabal Makla, I wanted Andrew to show me some of the other things nearby that all fit with the second half of the book of Exodus. The people camped here for about a year. In this massive expanse, I could just envision several million people receiving the law, building the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant, and becoming God's people. Some have wondered why God chose them. It certainly was not because they would never complain and they were always obedient. In Exodus 32, while Moses was still on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, a surprising and sad event happens at the mountain's base. So this is another site right next to Jabal Makla, which yeah. is Mount Sinai. Yeah. And the significance of this well, this site is covered in cow petroglyphs. Now, when the Saudis were showing this site in 1985, they said these look like Egyptian-style cow drawings. Huh. And, of course, this, we believe, is associated with the possible golden calf altar sites where wow. the children of Israel built an altar and molten, uh, made a cow out of gold. Wow. And they danced in front of it in front of Mount Sinai. Huh. And it's almost like just this natural platform here. Yeah, it's a natural rock outcrop. And you do see all these uh, cows around. Like up there, you do see some rare painted cows. Uh-huh. Just in the overhang there, there's two there. Oh, yeah. And then around the corner, you'll see some carved ones. It's uh, quite interesting. Oh, yeah. You Look see at that. This carved onto the black, the, the natural patina of this rock of these ancient cow... Uh, drawings hit them. Um, the petroglyphs are carved into the rock, etched into the rock. And then are there other animals? There are. You have ibex here. Uh -huh. And you see some of them are lighter color, like they're different ages. Sure. Like people use this as a billboard. So who has studied this and what have they concluded? They actually haven't really studied it. Huh. So besides that initial declaration, and then they put a, you know, a fence around it, they haven't really done any other work. No kidding. Again, they're just all over the face of these rocks. See some right there. You see a, a nice one right here. So in ancient Egypt, there were a number of cow gods, you know, pagan gods. One was the Apis bull god, and the other one was the Hathor goddess. And she was, interesting about that goddess, she was the goddess of music and dance and basically partying and artisans. So those who would make a golden calf. So the biblical story, yeah. Moses is up on Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, and he's up there a while. 40 days, totally. And they're starting to say, well, he must have died or whatever. You know, he's not coming back. Aaron, make us a golden calf. I mean, what yeah. a weird thing. Do you think that there were just some people that were into idolatry, you know, that came out of Egypt that were already kind of already into the worship of a cow? Possible. I mean, if you think about it, they were slaves for hundreds of years in Egypt. 
So they knew about the pagan system. And so, but the strange thing is they're doing this in front of God's presence. The fire on the mountains there still. Yeah, and, you know, it comes down to the first commandment. They heard the Ten Commandments. This is after God, you know, spoke it. Thou shalt not make any other gods before me. I, I know, it just saddens me. And I, I know that I'm not going to be too hard on them because we do things too. But to hear from God, and they just came through the Red Sea not that long ago. That was a mega miracle, like probably the biggest on scale miracle ever. And here they are just quickly uh, worshiping false deities And it's it's just a sad thing. And then people died as a result of this. You know, Moses came down and literally threw down the tablets and broke. We broke the law. You know, obviously we need a redeemer. And that's the whole point of the law. The whole point of the commandments, they're right, they're good, but we cannot save ourselves. We cannot keep them. And therefore we had to have one come that could keep the law. It was a schoolmaster that brought us, brings us to Christ, right? Exactly. Points out our sins, but can't save us from the sins. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Wow. This is poignant. Incredible. All right, Andrew, here we are at the base of Jebel Makla, yes. which is in the Jebel Allah's range. Yes, it is. And you're telling me we're going to hike to that? We will try. I think we'll make it up there. Okay, well, who's carrying me is the question. <laughs> we, I think we hired some donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I could probably make it an eighth of the way without any trouble. Well, you know, Moses, it says in the Bible, he went up twice in one day, but we don't know how far he got. He might have went halfway and God like spoke from above. We're talking about a guy in his 80s, right? Yeah. Oh, my so goodness. I think we could do it. Okay. So I'm in my early 50s. You're in your late, late 40s. Mid 40s. Yeah. So, all right. Well, I know you can do it because you've done this how many times? Uh, seven times to this summit and then oh, a couple goodness. to the other ones. Oh, so. wow. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, so Andrew, we've gone quite a ways now. Yeah. Let me show the viewers. Okay, so we've climbed 39 feet. So we're we're, we're almost right. there, right? Yeah, another five feet. Good thing I'm not out of breath either. So. That's cool. So Looks where like are we going? Woods. We're going to go up to that black peak oh, right there. Oh, no. What in the world, Andrew? Well, our last tour group... Um, didn't make it too far. Wow. So we just abandoned our vehicle. I was going to say, if this is what you're using for your tours, you're probably not going to get a whole lot of people to yeah, come. Um, we'll have to upgrade our vehicles <laughs> next time. Well, I'll tell you this. The vehicles that you're using for this trip, oh, they're yeah. top-notch. They're beautiful. You like the refrigerator? It has a refrigerator. Come on. Cold drinks in the desert. That's the key. <laughs> yeah. Near the beginning of our hike, Andrew wanted to show us an interesting ruin. This enclosure is ancient, and some think fit the biblical description of Exodus 20 and 24, where the Bible says that Moses set up an altar at the foot of the mountain after writing down God's laws in the Book of the Covenant. The altar was constructed along with 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And here is evidence of what looks like an animal enclosure and marble pillars. At the very bottom of this mountain, you find this animal-shaped corral that has these stones all lined up in an L-shaped pattern where the animals could come in and not get scared and keep going around the corner, so it's kind of a boomerang shape. They don't see that they're blocked in. They have to turn a corner, so they'll enter, and you say once one goes in... They all follow. They all follow. And in fact, an animal corral design expert in America, she looked at this and said this is how she would design an animal corral, the whole same layout. And there was archaeology done here? Yes. In the late 1990s, the Saudis excavated. And what's interesting, they had found layers of ash on that one end, the northern end of this altar. And so you have evidence of things being burnt there. Now, sadly, the report was very vague and not complete. And so we don't know exactly what type of animals were burnt or what all was found. It'd be great to reexamine. Like if you could find out that these are kosher animals, that would be huge. All right, so it looks like there's some drawings here on this rock. Yeah, these are uh, ancient petroglyphs. You have people with their hands up, 
kind of uh, dancing around. You do see some ibex or animal figures. So we're not exactly sure who carved it, but it's but at we, the base of the mountain. We do know there was an orgy during you know, the, the Ten Golden Commandments that came down the Golden Calf. So yeah. it's curious, isn't it? Okay, so you said we're oh, we're going to zigzag up this thing. And get yeah, to we're going to go kind of up. There's an animal trail kind okay. of partway up here. And we follow these piles of rocks. So these little piles you see, um, that's kind of marking the animal trail. <laughs> the shepherds, even some of us, we start piling up the rocks. So it kind of marks the trail. You look for um, the animal hoof prints and their um, dungs. So you follow the dung trail. <laughs> okay, whatever works. You know, usually you're following breadcrumbs, but... Yeah. <laughs> Well, the donkey and the sheep, <laughs> or goats, probably going up here. Okay, so we have climbed up higher. You know you're higher because I can't see the air anymore. The view is spectacular. I am tired, but I don't know. This is still worth it, you know? And I know we're not even, what, halfway to the halfway, but... You got the adventure, the exertion, you know, if you want to do something worthwhile, you got to work for it. So that's what we're doing. Okay, so a little progress report. Yeah. We've been going about an hour, a little under an hour. You're saying we're going there. Yeah, we're going on the other side, but we're going to take this route to the left. Okay. Slowly making our way up the side of this uh, face of Sinai. It's been uh, not horrible to come up this far. Yeah. Is it going to get steeper as we go? There's a certain parts that will be steeper. Oh, okay. sure. Okay. Like a little slower. This is very special, though, to be attempting this climb. Appreciate you guiding us. I always say, why am I doing this when climbing? <laughs> It's such a long climb, but I love being, when you're up here, you feel so peaceful. Yeah. And just imagining God's presence and fire being up there and oh, man. what happened here. All right, so we made it to, you call this the plateau? Yeah, it's this basin area, like halfway up, this mm -hmm. midpoint where there's this flat spot. Mount Sinai, you read through the scriptures and, and you're reading through Exodus and Numbers and mm -hmm. even in the New Testament. That's you know, so. Paul mentions Mount Sinai in Arabia. Yeah, Galatians 4, 25. Everybody. Yeah, in Galatians 1, he says he came to Arabia, yeah. probably just like Elijah came to Mount Horeb, to come and learn from God himself. You know, he had grown up as a... Pharisee and you know he's a Jew of the Jews he missed like the main thing in the Old Testament and that's the picture of Messiah as we know as Jesus so here at this place you think back to Moses and you think back to the the thunderings and the, the lightnings and the ground shaking the sound of the trumpets I get a sense of that right now like we're at the place that... You can imagine that happening here. And then it says the fire that went to the very heaven. It says in Exodus 19. I mean, what a sight. And everything seems to fit. And then also the Bible talks about 70 elders, Moses, Aaron, and... Her, and Joshua. Joshua. They were all yeah. probably, they would have come to this spot because this is a great spot to kind of... It was like we did. We just had a yeah. lunch here. Yeah. It said they ate with God in Exodus uh, 24, I believe. Man. Yeah. Okay, so it's all fitting. Even the top is blackened. You know, we're not saying that it was blackened by the presence of God, but it is curious yeah. that the top of this mountain and these mountains right here are, you know, basalt or, you know, it looks like it's volcanic. But even though the Arabic name for the mountain, Jebel Makla, means burning or burnt. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, there's so many things that fit here, but we're standing on this mountain that is probably Mount Sinai, also called Horeb, Mount yes, Horeb. and they called the Mountain of God. Mountain of God. Those are the three biblical names, but we also know it as... Jebel Makla. Makla. The modern Arabic name for and it. And then also Jebel Allah's, which is kind of the, the range. range of, and Allah's means... The Mount, Mountain of Almonds. Almonds. So why would that be the name of this range? Do you know? Well, you know, there are groves of wild almond trees growing on this mountain range. 
And what's really interesting is the staff of Aaron was made from almond, an almond branch. Yeah. Remember, they are uh, rebelling again. And so Moses said, okay, we'll see who is the, should be the chosen or the leader. And Aaron's rod budded and wow. almond blossoms. Wow. So wow. it was from an almond tree. And also in the sanctuary service, you have the almond motifs in like the menorah. Yep. The seven branch candlestick, you have almond buds and blossoms used in the gold candlestick. It's just like. So that, that stuff comes from the mountain. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. So this is really amazing. As you've been doing tours and as you come here, maybe for the first time, what did that feel like to you? There's a peace here. Usually like you climb in a mountain, you're just all about the climb. Mm-hmm. Here you get there, get to like this place or mainly the summit. You just feel like, wow, imagine that like, God's presence was here at the very top. You can almost feel it, the same thing that Moses being here felt. Yeah. To be able to climb it, it's physically exerting. But to think Moses was 80, at least, he climbed it a bunch of times. Yeah. And then the the elders were old, right? 70 elderly. (laughs) Yeah, elderly. Uh, We never would have found anything, you know, in these areas, but having a guide like you has been great. So you're saying we're going up there. Is that what you're trying to say? That's our plan. You know, it's uh, a little afternoon. Our okay. goal is to get up there by two. Okay. It gives us an hour, hour and a half to explore okay. the summit. All right. And then come on down by three. All right. So. Nice. Wow. Look at the mountain. What? There is the peak. Oh, that is so cool. Look at that. The blackened peak of Mount Sinai. That is so unusual. It just goes all the way over. See it? Three peaks have it. Okay. And that's the peak that we're going up to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow, we've actually made it. Andrew, this- you said. <laughs> Just another. Almost there. Almost there, another 500. Just over the next peak. Here it is. Yeah, here we go. Made it to the top, at least the south peak. Yeah, of we're here. Ajobo Makwa. And this was one of the most physically challenging things I've done for a long time. Tough climb. Yeah, you know, but hey, we made it. It's worth it. Absolutely worth it because we're standing in the place where God's presence was and the glory of God, the fire of God, right, was right here. So it was like a fire ascending to the very heavens. And so if you think that would be an amazing sight if you're camped out here like the Israelites or the Midianites to the west. In Alberta, you can see this mountain on fire. And certainly, you know, the shaking, the thundering, the lightning, you know, it must have been quite a sight and also unsettling a little bit, especially for people who have no idea what's going on. Yeah, I'm remembering the verse where they say, Moses, you speak to us. Do not let God talk to us or we'll die. And so they, then they ran back to their tents. Mm-hmm. It must have been an awesome display of power up here. You don't feel like Moses would have come up to the peak he would have come up into the cloud. What do you feel about that? Where would yeah. he have received the Ten Commandments? You know, the Bible's unclear. It just says God called him further up. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't say the summit. We don't know how far down the cloud covered the mountain. But he was close enough that it said in the Hebrews that he feared for his life. God instructed them to build a tabernacle. Mm-hmm. And the tabernacle later would become the temple. And it had certain parts of that that was very, very holy at the very center. So how does that apply to this mountain? Yeah, well, it's very interesting if you look at the layout of this mountain to where the encampment would be. So here we are on this southern ridge of Jebel Makla. If you start here, if you go eastward, west to east, just like the tabernacle layout, yeah. you have this most holy site on the very top where only Moses was allowed to go up and talk to God. And in the tabernacle, you had a most holy room, uh, this square room where only the high priest would go in once a year. And then from there, moving eastward, you'd go to the holy place where the priests were allowed. And same thing here, you have, going eastward, you have a plateau Mm -hmm. where they had the 70 elders, uh, Aaron, uh, Joshua, her, they came up and ate with God. You had the table showbread there in the tabernacle. And then moving further out, you come to the courtyard where they had the sacrificial system, where they had the altar burnt offering and the laver. At the base of this mountain, you have the stream bed going out. 
And past that, you have an altar site, mm-hmm. who we believe is the altar of Moses. Wow. And then you go further out is the encampment, just like you have in the layout of the sanctuary service. So it's a perfect match. You yeah. think of the layout of the mountain to the tabernacle itself. In the direction, you know, it's, again, it's, it's another piece of the puzzle. Everything seems to fit right here to this being the place, uh, you know, even the direction. Yeah, of, amazing. you know, the top of the mountain all the way down and, and having that bench, that plateau where, you know, multiple people could sit and observe. And then you have lots of room in the plane for several million people. Yeah. So again, all of the puzzle pieces fit together, but this being the very center of God's holiness. And I still feel like when we're standing on Mount Sinai, you know, you, you sense God's holiness, his reverence, his wrath too against sin. It, it all culminates here because Moses is taking down these two tablets that God wrote. I mean, a lot of the Bible, all of the Bible, God breathed through men and moved them along in what to write. But God wrote here and on the wall in Babylon. You know, it's, it's a rare thing when God writes. And so these tablets of the commandments of God, and those are the basic laws. And then they had a lot of other laws for, you know, for the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. But these are still things that are important for us today. You know, these are basic things that almost every society observes. You don't steal, you don't lie, you know, you don't kill. And this is where the law comes from. It was given here, the Mm -hmm. voice of God. First, he verbally gave it, then he wrote it on stone, showing how permanent it is. Yeah. This has been one of the big privileges of my life, Andrew, to stand here. And I would never have come here if it weren't for you. Thank you so much. I'm glad to help you guys out. This has been quite an adventure. We've seen evidence of Israel in Egypt, a logical route to a dead end on a beach that could hold several million freed slaves, a deep body of water with a natural walkable slope, several oases in Saudi Arabia that fit the biblical descriptions of Israel's camps, archaeological evidence for Jethro and the Midians, a split rock, altars, a large plain, and a mountain that fits all the Bible's criteria. While I'm not absolutely positive that we're at the real Mount Sinai, everything seems to fit. But I am positive about something. God is real. He's powerful and he's holy. 